Thanks all for coming to the webinar on Starlink Tech. I'm going to assume that everybody has heard of Starlink and has a basic understanding of what Starlink actually is. If you don't, then please go to my website, l2sfbc.com, and check out my YouTube channel where I explain the basics of Starlink um, for those that are not familiar with it. I'm also going to assume that everyone here has some form of interest generally in using Starlink whilst traveling, either in motion or when you come to a stop when camping. And that's really what the focus is going to be about. It is going to be a live Q&A, so you can put your questions into the Q&A section. We'll do our best to answer them. Now, my two guests today are Marcus Tuck and Mike from Mike on Space. I'm going to i uh, get them to introduce themselves briefly. I'm going to kick off, kick off a couple of questions and you guys can um, feel free to add your own questions into that Q&A. So Marcus, welcome and thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Can you just give us a bit of a background of your Starlink story and your background, please? Okay, uh, I've been traveling in my uh, Vico Daily 4x4, which has been converted into a motorhome for the last eight years, traveling around the world, uh, been through Europe, Africa, and all of the Americas. Uh, when I was up in Canada last year, I was able to get hold of Starlink and we've been traveling with Starlink now for a year. Um, my background career wise, uh, I joined the Air Force as a radar technician, did that for about five years and then became air crew, uh, eventually becoming a navigator and uh, specializing in avionics, getting a master's degree in avionics. So I've kind of got a bit of an electro electronic background as well. And I'm used to sort of phase arrays and things like that. Thanks so much. And, and with Starlink, I believe you've, um, you've modified it quite a bit now to the point where it's in motion on your vehicle. Yeah, I don't like standard things. I like tweaking things a little bit and playing with them and seeing what you can get away with. So, uh, yeah, I've uh, modified the power supply so I can run on uh, DC now rather than going through the inverter. And I'm attaching it to the roof uh, flat. So uh, it works fine up there. I don't have to set up or pack down or pack up. Uh, when I arrive at a campsite and while I'm driving, it's working as well. It's uh, fantastic. Right. Thanks so much. And Mike, um, what's your journey with Starlink been and what's your background? Yeah, thanks. So I got interested in Starlink, I guess, when it was still just the early concept that Elon Musk announced. Geez, I think it was a few, quite a few years ago now. But uh, uh, as soon as it was available in the public beta, I got my hands on one. And my focus initially was really on the, the technology and the, the security aspects. My background, I'm an electrical engineer, and I've kind of specialized in security, whether that's hardware, firmware security, or, or more lately, software security. So I was really interested in that aspect. And I actually immediately tore mine apart to take a look at the insides. And it, almost the day after I did my first teardown, somebody else went even further. So it seemed a shame to tear it apart. So I started experimenting with it and using it as, as, as you know, as it was a bit more intended and really became interested in the aspects of having something so small and portable for taking it camping and more recently uh, taking it on the road mobile. So that's kind of been my journey of experimentation with the Starlink units. Okay, thanks so much. And yeah, you also should mention that Mike runs the Mike on Space Facebook channel, mm -hmm. which is pretty informative about a bunch of things, including Starlink. And for me, I'm an automotive journalist specializing in four wheel drives, fast cars and towing. And the attraction for Starlink for me, and I have one, is that I can take it into remote areas um, where, <clears throat> where I live in Australia and I can still work as a journalist. So I've set it up on beaches, I've set it up in deserts, I've set it up um, in our alpine area with a zero, absolutely zero internet reception, and I still get faster broadband speeds than people do in Australian cities, and I find that vastly amusing. So, that, so that, that's my interest there. Okay, so the first question then from Anonymous is, how stable is the connection on roaming versus at home? Is it possible to have a professional video conference without cut? Well, Marcus is presently coming to you via Starlink, as am I, so that's going to answer that question. So um, my first experience is that, yeah, I've used it quite a bit, but there are the occasional minor service interruptions and freezes. Marcus, what have you found? Yeah, generally, I find it's pretty good. Um, I'm quite a long way south now. I mean, my registered address is up in uh, Nevada, and I'm actually down just outside Mexico City at the moment. So I don't know how many miles that is, but it's, it's quite a good distance, and obviously in a different country. 
Um, down at the latitude I'm at the moment, I'm at about uh, 19 degrees, 40 minutes north. And down here, there are a few gaps between the satellites. So we are getting a, a, the occasional dropout. Um, nothing too significant. As you can see, I'm, I'm having a video conference with you now. And it's, it's pretty seamless. You, just, you, you might just get a, a one second or a one and a half, two second kind of drop. But uh, it picks right up again afterwards. I think, I think the, the, other than video conferencing, if, you, if you're just doing streaming of TV or email or internet, you wouldn't notice it because the buffering and the download speed is so fast, the buffer can catch it all. Um, but video conferencing, that's that's really the, the challenge for it. But as you can see, it's working reasonably slick. Yeah. And Mike, what, what's your view on um, interruptions and streaming use and so on? How, how useful have you found it on day to day use? Yeah, so I use it a fair bit uh, just for my own personal use. My day job, a big part of that is talking with with customers. So I haven't fully made the switch over to using it for my for my day job just because you know, it wouldn't look good having to then explain the whole backstory that I'm using Starlink and <laughs> everything like that. So I'm still using my my home connection for, let's say, my day job work. But certainly, as Marcus said, for pretty much anything else, even conferences like this, I think it's come a huge way from maybe a year ago when it would be really kind of shaky to now, as Marcus says, it's pretty much perfect bar those ever so often little one or two second outages. It's, it's really improved a lot. Yeah, one thing you can do is you can load this. There's kit out there now which allows you to load balance multiple internet connections. So at home, I've got Starlink plugged into uh, Ubiquity, uh, if you pronounce it, Edge Router 4, um, which balances uh, my, my WISP, uh, wide internet service provider, with Starlink. And it mostly uses Starlink, but then it will fail over to the other one. You could also do that with a 4 or 5G as well. So there's options, options there. Okay, now, uh, Marcus, let's talk about power because one of the problems to Starlink for travelers is that it relies on AC power, 230, 220 volts. Um, that means you've got to run it for an inverter, you've got to take an inverter, then you, there's an efficiency drop. But you've actually converted yours to 12 volts. So what sort of improvement did you find in power usage? And is that something anyone can do? How straightforward was it? It's The way I've done it is probably not the most straightforward because what, what I've done is I've actually taken the SpaceX power supply apart and I've, I've intercepted the output of the switch mode power supply when it's down to 56 volts and it starts going through the rectifiers to go through the DC circuit. And I've basically tapped into there and I've injected my own uh, 56 volt signal from a uh, 12 volt to 56 volt uh, boost box circuit. Um, the advantage of doing this was if you look at an inverter, when an inverter is running, whether it's got a load or no load, it has an operating current. And my inverter uses about one and a half amps just to, to work. And that's without the load of Starlink on it. And when you consider that Starlink, when it's running um, in its normal mode, it's averaging only about two and a half amps. You stick a one and a half amp load of an inverter running on top of that, it's significant. It, uh, my calculations, it was about 29% uh, reduction in power by cutting the inverter out of the loop, um, simply because you're not wasting energy with an inverter. Uh, so it was quite beneficial for me. Now, that will work with the round dishes, the version one and the version two, because they've got this external power supply. Um, the version three has the power supply built into the router. I suspect the same could be done. Um, I haven't opened up one of those routers to see the power supply inside, but I'm sure you could tap into it in, this, in a similar way to the way I've done it. But what I would w warn is, is you really need to know what you're doing. The voltage is in there. Um, a lethal voltage is normally considered 50 volts DC and 100 volts AC. And well, you've got you've got voltages in excess of that inside the power supply, so you really don't want to be messing around in there unless you know what you're doing. I'll always get some smart ass saying, "Oh, it's not the voltage that kills you; it's the current." But without the voltage, you won't get the current flow. So that's why everybody discusses the voltage is the lethal voltage. Yeah. Um, what some people have done, they with the version three is they've um, used a telco, I think it is. It's a POE injection box, and they've basically cut their uh, Ethernet cable coming from the dish. They've changed the wire configuration slightly, and they're putting it into the POE box, and then they're feeding in a voltage there. The reason I didn't really want to go down that route is it works, but you don't have any circuit protection. There is no protection on the Ethernet cable, only the power supply that you use to power it that may have some kind of circuit protection. What I was really surprised at when I opened up the SpaceX power supply is just how much electronics is in there 
um, protecting the dish and the router. Uh, it's got several uh, electronic uh, fuses in there on several of the wires. So it's not just one fuse covering the whole thing. And it also checks the cable to make sure it's uh, suitable and the device on the end can accept PoE before it puts the power on. And if you just use the, the basic PoE injector box, you lose all of those, those levels of protection. Okay. Yeah. So what I found is um, I don't have the background to convert my um, my system to 12 volts. So I'm using a, an inverter. Uh, tip on that is um, I find a 400 watt inverter works pretty nicely. That's more than enough power for Starlink plus a laptop or something like that. But do make sure it is pure sign, not modified sign. I have tried a couple of, mod of modified signs and I just haven't found that they have worked. Um, the other tip I would use is switch it off overnight because otherwise it would just sit there drawing battery power um, and there's obviously no solar going in if you're not using it so I would switch it off and I didn't do that once and um, yeah had it had not totally depleted but it was but the batteries were, were lower than what I, I would have liked overnight so that's my, my tip there. Uh, Mike anything you've got to say on the, on the subject of power um, to, to Starlink? No I think just seconding you Robert I've got a, a 400 watt uh, inverter that I've been using as well a uh, pure sine wave I also tried a few modified sine waves and they just in the gen one, so the very first power yeah. supply with the black pole didn't even start it up at all. I haven't yet tried it with the gen three, the rectangle dish, although I do have a power supply that Marcus has already uh, nudged me to tear it apart for him so I can show him what circuits are inside. So just before I tear it apart, I'll try it with a, a modified sine wave inverter and we'll see if that works. But I'm also waiting for the, uh, the, the aftermarket injector to try it out with that non-Starlink power supply. My goal there is not so much to make it more efficient as to reduce the weight, because yeah. I really am looking at getting the whole thing set up to be man portable. I've got a, a flexible solar panel that's 60 watts with 120 watt and a 400 watt inverter. That's really only a small window of time. But if I can get that power down to be you know, 30, 40 watts, then you're looking at actual potential continuous usage in daylight at least. So I'm, I'm hopeful that once those parts come in, I'll have more to share, but I think it's going to be a pretty impressive setup. When you say man portable, are you planning on going hiking with Starlink? That's what I'd like to do now. <laughs> it's, it's portable for internet, but it's still not that light, especially the round dish. But um, maybe starting with a, a canoe trip or something like that, where the weight isn't directly on my back. But we'll see. We'll see. Oh, that, that's going to be pretty cool. All right. Now let's talk about the orientation of the dish, because we've all noticed that the Starlink dish starts off pointing vertically upwards and then it orients itself um, it, there is a room that it always orients itself south in the southern hemisphere and always north in the northern hemisphere, but I've seen evidence that that's not actually the case. And why doesn't it point vertically upwards? Because that's where the satellites are. I mean, we're talking lower, lots of lower satellites. I can't remember how many Elon's put up there at the moment. I know we obviously tried to put up a few recently and, and um, it didn't quite make it, but there's still going to be many thousands of them up there. Why doesn't Starlink point um, straight up? And what have you found when it does point straight up? Marcus, we'll ask you that first. Uh, I, I was fairly sad and I read through the patent and the FCC approvals in the early days when I was kind of getting excited about getting it. And basically the concept was to have it just pointing straight up. And then they realized that in the early days of Starlink, when there weren't gonna be very many satellites uh, in the sky, the satellites would more than likely be passing in position fairly close to the horizon. And so the idea was introduced to tilt the, the dish over because the dish has a field of view of about 110 degrees. So if it's pointing straight up, it can't see anything until it gets 40 degrees above the horizon. So that's, I think, where the tilt came from. Um, the tilting away from the equator, uh, a lot of people say it's because they're trying to avoid the geo satellites uh, over the equator. I'm, I'm not totally convinced by that. Uh, what it tends to do is it... It basically it sits looking vertically, it gets the satellites, it works out where they are, and then it points, what I always say is it always points in the optimum direction. I mean, I've been sufficiently far north, I've been up at uh, above uh, 54 north, sorry, yeah, 54 north, and the dish is pointing south because there weren't any satellites north of it. So even though I was in the northern hemisphere, the dish was pointing south because that's where the satellites were. In British Columbia, I've also seen it pointing east and west. 
again, depending upon where the chain of satellites happen to be passing my position. So I think really uh, the, the, the whole tilt thing is, is a, a hang back from the early days when there weren't many satellites. Now we've got so many satellites in the sky, I, I don't think we really need the tilt function anymore by pointing straight up. It's still got its uh, 110 degrees of view in all in 360 degrees of azimuth. So uh, yeah, it works fine. Okay, yeah, that's good because um, when I go traveling, I often can't find a sort of. Uh, it's easier to point the dish straight up because there, there tends to be less obstructions. That would be my view. So it's heartening to know. Um, Mike, any um, comment you've got on dish orientation and um, stuff like that? Yeah, I think. <clears throat> If you were kind of following Starlink, you know, this time last year in all the public forums, the focus was on, you know, what was your latitude, right? Because the way the satellites are curving around the earth, they're going in a circle, but the density is a bit tighter, you know, towards the, that 53 degrees north or south. So I think like Marcus said, initially that was a big, you had to kind of point to where there was the most density so that you would have fewer outages. But but now, hopefully at the rate they're launching satellites, I think there's over 2000 now that really the density is kind of increasingly good enough, even straight up. And certainly the tests that Marcus has done and that I've been doing tend to support that, that even if your dish is, is flat, pointing straight up at the sky, your service still seems to be pretty good and pretty uninterrupted. Yeah, so that's what you found because you've now mounted your dish permanently facing just purely vertically upwards, Marcus, and you found it to be fine, right? Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so that, so that's a tip. So I think that's that's a big deal for um, us who travel because having the dish face vertically upwards means you're far less obstructions. It also means that you can more easily sort of permanently mount it on a caravan or a truck or whatever else, as opposed to having something facing you know 45 degrees to the to the horizontal. So I think that that's a huge 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 win for us. Um, but in order to do that, you either need to disable the motors or put the thing in some form of cradle so it can't do it. How easy is it to disable the motors? On the round one, it's very easy. The, uh, in, in the center of the round dish around the mast, there's a little plastic cover. Just put a couple of screwdrivers in the crack, and just pop it, it will just pop out. It doesn't damage it, you can put, clip it back in again. Once you've got that popped out, you can see the two motors and you can see the two cables going to the two motors and you just literally just unplug the, the electrical cables. Um, I then put some insulating tape over to stop any moisture or anything going into the motors and also to protect the pins. But that's basically it. That's it disabled. Yeah. The rectangular, the rectangular one's a little bit harder. Uh, I've seen online a few people have done it now. They drill a small hole in the back of the case because the case is, is effectively glued onto the actual uh, array. So there's no way of getting into it. But some people have done some teardowns now and you can actually see where the connector is on the PCB. So people have worked out what the dimensions are. They drill a small hole in the back of the case. They can reach in with a pair of needle nose pliers and unplug the, the motors that way. Okay. Have you done any anything like that, uh, Mike? Disabled the motors yet? Uh, so certainly on the the round dish, <laughs> I've, I've definitely disabled the motors. They're oh, okay. uh, yeah. they're gone. <laughs> but on the, uh, I managed to get my hands on a, a rectangle dish as well, and my main interest there is that. It is harder to take apart, as Marcus said, it's all glued together instead of the clips, but it's it's much, much lighter than the, the round dish. There's no metal back plane, uh, significantly smaller circuit board. So as we said earlier, my my goal of backpacking with the dish, my, my real focus now is on the rectangle dish, trying to get that one uh, in the similar kind of very flat setup. And as Marcus said, it's, it's much more destructive on that one to disable the motors. Yeah. But uh, I did early testing, even as far as last summer, you can check out my YouTube channel for the, the flat panel. It was working at really no motors, but I just manually tilted it kind of a bit northward facing. And it seems to handle that, you know, even as much as a year ago very well. And certainly my driving tests, even with no motor, and a little bit of motion of, of driving and it still works very very well without the motors okay. could you just show us that that um round dish again please just want to see what you've done to the back of it, it looks like suction mounts on it uh yeah so i so this metal back plane here 
this is the stock metal. Yeah. And there's four studs in the center, roughly the center. And that's where the motors actually connect to normally. Okay. And what I've done is pulled away all the white plastic, disconnected the motors, and I just put on some aluminum angle iron. Yeah. And just made a, a, a stand here. And these four corners, these are uh, rubber coated magnets. So it sticks to the roof of the vehicle. And I've got these white ropes on just as a, a backup um, while I was testing whether the magnets would hold well enough. Yep. The, they do work very well. I was driving on the highway at around 130 kilometers per hour, 80 miles per hour, and they were holding well. Although I will say I've done some later tests on a very windy day, also driving fast, and they didn't hold so well. So I'm glad I had the ropes in place. Uh, but I'm going to do some more experimentation with this as well. It's just a lot of weight to have held on by magnets, I think. Yeah, there's also probably some some lift going on there as well. So you might need a spoiler or two or something like, like, like that. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So what, yeah. So what we've established is that um, Starlink will work when it's pointed vertically and you can drive around. Okay. So, so that, um, that leads us on to the question of roaming. So as we know, Starlink was or is originally designed to be put in one location, your service address, and you weren't meant to go wandering around the world or Australia or places like that and then um, redo it. However, that has worked. So what works for me at the moment in Australia, because I don't have roaming enabled in my account, um, is that I would need to pick where I'm going and I change the service address. And the tip there is if you zoom in far enough, you can change it to anywhere. You don't need actually an address. And then I get service. And if I forget to do that I use my satellite phone to call a friend who's got a log into my account and they do it for me, which is not ideal, but there you go. However, um, there is roaming equals true, that flag set in debug now. So Marcus, you've had quite a bit of experience with this. Talk to us about the changes in roaming over the last weeks or months with Starlink. Yeah, I first noticed it back on the uh, 11th of February. I think I was probably the first guy to actually post it up. I mean, I, I don't know why I was selected, but maybe it's because I've changed address 140 times and used the system in over 250 locations. So maybe SpaceX kind of that flagged up to them a little bit. But what I found was um, I was looking for an address. I found, a, found an address as close as I could get. And I knew normally I can kind of get away with being about 15, 16 kilometers away. And that was my, that's been my basically my way of operating for the last year. Find, a, find an address. As long as I can find a camp location I want within about 15 kilometers of that, it's all good. The signal's a little bit scotchy because you're right on the edge of the cell. Um, well, then I found on the 11th uh, of Feb that I did that. And when we got to the campsite, I had a perfect signal. And I was like, well, where are all these dropouts? I'm expecting to get a few dropouts now because I'm 15 kilometers away from my registered address. So I went into the debug data and it, it had the roaming flag probably for one or two software versions before, but it had always been false. And this time, roaming was true. And then I went back and I had a look at the data and it was perfect. It was as if I was at my registered address. I thought, okay, this is, this is kind of cool. And it also had unexpected location true, which is what you get when you try and use it at a certain distance. It was a varying distance. It used to be like five to 10 kilometers away from your registered address. It would trip the flag to say unexpected location. And you'd kind of get a, you'd get a service, but it wouldn't be great. You, you go much beyond about 20 kilometers and really doesn't work and the performance drops off completely by the time you get to about 30 35 so yeah I'm, I'm set up 15 kilometers away i've got unexpected location which i expected but i had this roaming true and i had perfect service all night following day we packed up um sorry we, we shut down overnight switched on again in the morning and the system now the unexpected location was false so it's as if the servers back at spacex hq had seen my location from the night before and gone okay this is his new temporary address i'm going to update my database so that when i switch the system on again it knew where i was um, which was great then that day we drove we went about another five kilometers further away from the registered address it worked uh, we then drove the next day we went like 100 kilometers away and it still worked we, we messed around with the addresses a couple of times um, and then we went to uh, uh, nevada yeah nevada and we got an address there and we've been roaming from there. We've done, we've done 50 locations. Basically, we've gone from Nevada all the way down to Mexico City roaming. And the other nice thing we found with the roaming is you go to locations where if you try to place an order, it says it's not available yet, or they sell the sales full. We've had service in those locations. We went through the middle of Las Vegas, which is fully booked up. We had service. 
we went across to LA, we went right through the center of LA, you know, Julie likes shopping. So when she goes shopping, I sit in the back of the truck and geek away and kind of see what's happening with Starlink. And we were having service right in the middle of LA as well. It's been great. Hmm. Okay, that's fantastic to, um, to hear. Mark, anything to add to that? Not really much. I saw Marcus's post on the, the Starlink subreddit and immediately put my dish in the, the trunk and started driving to get outside of my service area just to try it out. And and I was devastated when it didn't work. <laughs> but I tried again the next weekend. And as soon as that one week later, it actually started to work. And, and very much as Marcus described it first, it seemed like it it didn't work for maybe five minutes. And then all of a sudden, it just started working. Um, I think even at that time, the unexpected location flag had already just stopped being relevant. It always, it never indicated it was unexpected. It just switched over to roaming equals true. And then it started working. So it seems like the, the rollout was probably phased. I think mine started working maybe two weeks after Marcus first reported it. And it feels like broadly in North America, I'm hearing from a lot of different people now that it's working very much as described. So it does seem to be rolling out gradually and now it's in the official terms of service for Starlink in North America at least called um, Starlink portability. Uh, so it, it seems like it's official and that it's here to stay. So it's, it's exciting times. Yeah, for, for my experience, I've got roaming equals false on my uh, account. Um, so I thought that meant, okay, roaming equals false. I'm at my home, therefore I'm not actually roaming. So mm -hmm. I took it somewhere else and um, it, it didn't say unexpected location, which I've had when it's been away from a service address and not changed it. Um, and it connected, but it didn't actually give me service. So it didn't really throw an error, which was a bit annoying. So I'm um, changing the service address, fix that. So I think that's where I'm at at the moment. I emailed Starlink support and said, um, Elon says it's all right for me to get on the beta. And I said, get stuffed. Um, <laughs> and I said, thank you for your interest, yada, yada. As and when we have another spot, we'll, we'll let you know. So, um, yeah, the, the, thing, the thing about Starlink is whatever you hear about it now will probably change in a week, two weeks' time. It is an evolving situation. Um, and we've just got to keep up to date. And that's where, you know, looking at Mike's channel and Marcus's website and mine, I, I do more occasional stuff from Starlink is, is good. Um, and But they do have this objective of portability they do want to make it truly portable i expect a 12 volt is coming so what you what we're talking at here is really sort of early early adopter stuff okay Mark, I just back on go. one yeah, other go. thing on the roaming i think there's um some confusion people see that they've got roaming in their debug data and they think they have roaming it and yeah. i don't think the roaming is actually dependent upon the software which is in your dish no. roaming is some, is a feature which is turned on on your account and SpaceX can turn it on and off. I mean, I, I was amazed to get it and it's great, but I, I was really surprised that it's not a, a, an extra subscription you, you would pay for to get roaming. So I'd imagine maybe in the future that will come and it will be turned on and off depending upon whether you subscribe to it. A bit like on the Tesla, you have autopilot. The, the, the car has all the autopilot features, but you have to subscribe to get those features. Yeah, that, that's right. That, that's what caught me out. I thought roaming equals false meant I wasn't roaming at the moment, but it was enabled. In fact, that means I don't have roaming. That, that's the difference. And where I live in Melbourne, in Australia, um, I think that cell is at capacity. Now, I'm going to go on a trip shortly. So when I move my service address out um, into the where I'm going, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to get back, but I'm just going to take that risk and just see what happens because I guess at some point I'm going to get back. Um, who knows? I mean, no one knows exactly how, how this stuff works. All we're doing is kind of reverse engineering how it works from, I guess, the crowdsourced experience from people and educated, educated guesses, yeah. One other thing I've seen, which comes back to what Mike was saying, Mike said he set up somewhere and he, he didn't seem to see any service for a few minutes and then it started. Um, I've seen that in a, in a number of locations now it appears that Starlink actually puts cells to sleep. And then what they do is at some interval, they will scan that cell and see if there are any users there. If they are, they will wake up the system and then start providing service there. I've seen that in a couple of places in the US. I've set up, I've gone into the debug data. My dish is transmitting like mad and it's getting nothing back from any of the satellites. And then after maybe four or five minutes, it will get one very quick ping from, from a satellite. And then a couple of minutes later, bang, the whole thing comes up. So it looks like they, they have implemented some kind of sleep mode. Now, that gave me a few problems in motion in Mexico, 
because I was driving through an area of Mexico where I would imagine all the cells were asleep because I was actually off the, uh, the map which uh, SpaceX has put out for Mexico. So it's in an area where you can't actually order in Mexico. And I was finding as I was going down the road, we were getting an awful lot of dropouts. We weren't getting any service. And I think what was happening is I was waking up the cells, but because I was doing 80 kilometers an hour down the main road, I was actually driving through the cell and out the other side before the cell woke up. But when I, whenever I stopped, the system had a couple of seconds to catch up with me. And then I, then I got the, the full speed. And that's, that's the only time I've experienced that. Normally when I'm driving, it's no problem other than you get an obstruction because you've driven past a big tree or you've gone under a, a, road, a road bridge or something like that. Okay. Mike, any, any comment on this? Just I can imagine somewhere there's a network operations center in Starlink HQ and somebody's getting pinged and they're like, oh, Marcus is driving through Mexico and geez, yeah, oh, he's yeah. waking up all these cells and oh, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I was joking at Marcus before. It's like I can just imagine the Starlink network. Up. Hey, this weird stuff is going on. What's going on? Oh, it's Tuck. Yeah, OK, don't worry about it. He's doing something weird again. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so, Mike, you, you've done um, technical teardowns um, of you really looked in, into the, the detail of what, what sort of cool stuff, interesting stuff have you found which could be relevant to people who travel with Starlink? Yeah, I think some of the stuff that's been most interesting to me is, uh, well, I guess a couple things that I've been kind of verifying. The first is all my kind of mobility and driving tests have been with the the original generation one Starlink. And when you look at the teardowns, people have done teardowns of that very, very first one. The second one, the, the round one with the gray pole, the gen two and the rectangle gen three. And in each generation, they've reduced the number of components on the circuit board. So I was a little bit worried that Maybe the mobility driving with Starlink was working with Gen 1, but maybe they took those parts out and it wouldn't work with the rectangle one. Uh, but people have done driving tests with the rectangle dish and it appears to be working just as well. So besides the difficulty of pulling it apart, it appears that the, the electronics and the, the software uh, work equally well for, for mobility and roaming across all the versions even though I, I have heard that in the US, Starlink is applying through the FCC to actually get you know, licensed for mobility, mm -hmm. Earth station in motion, which is worth pointing out that all the people driving with Starlink, including me, isn't strictly authorized under <laughs> their license, but it looks like they're not pursuing licensing for the Gen 1 dish just because they don't make them anymore and they're focusing on the new ones. So while it does work, it looks like long-term they're kind of focusing on the future, which, which makes sense. But it was nice to see that it appears that every generation has the, the hardware, if there is any specific hardware, but has the, the capability of being mobile. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, okay, so a question from Josh Hayes. Have anyone cut the Gen 1 cable to reduce the length? If so, what have you used? Did it have any problems? Um, I haven't cut my cable, but what I have done is I've got an RJ45 Ethernet socket on the outside of my house and inside. So I just plug my Starlink in and out, um, and that's how I get the cable inside. And at the other end of that, I've just got a Cat6 cable um, going to my um, ubiquitous ed edge router. So I haven't cut it, but I don't imagine there would be a problem um, cutting it. Have either of you cut the cable? Yeah, I've cut mine down. Um, I had a Gen 1 in Canada, and unfortunately, because I couldn't take it across to the US, I then, I then had to buy a second one uh, for the US, which is a Gen 2. And I sold my Gen 1 to a Canadian, so it's, it's not wasted hardware, it's being used. What I found, um, I was averaging about 100 watts of power on the Gen 1 back then on the early software. I chopped 80 feet of cable, um, and that reduced my power consumption by 5 watts. So wow. it's a good power cycle. Yeah. Okay, there's, there's a great tip then. So shorten the cable, that makes sense actually. Shorten the cable, reduce power consumption. That's a really good tip for, for, for us travelers there. Mike, have you cut any cables? No, I haven't yet. I'm actually waiting for my DC adapter setup like we talked about earlier. And then I kind of want to wait and see that power drop that Marcus just mentioned to kind of give myself that warm, fuzzy feeling. But I have not cut it yet. I'm still using the stock cable. 
Okay, well, when you cut it, let me know, and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll send my, my readers a link to your channel because the, the, the cable is too long, really, for, for overlanding mm. use. And if we can reduce that, that's extra hassle, extra weight, and also less power. I mean, it, it's, it's a triple win for, for um, well, I'm going to call them travellers, but I know the term kind of overlanders for a lot of North American people. So, yeah, that, that, that's fantastic, yeah. Okay. The only thing I'd say is you've got to make sure that when you use an RJ45, it's a shielded one. So it's got the metal jacket on it. And then the uh, in the uh, the Ethernet cable, which is effectively what it is, there's like a, a foil wrap around the outside of the twisted pairs, and there's like a a, a solid metal wire in there, a, 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 an uninsulated wire in amongst those foil. So you fold the foil back, you fold that wire back, and then when you crimp the RJ45 on, you need to make sure that that wire and that foil is making an electrical contact with the jacket. It it's pretty obvious when you do it, but it's important to do that. Someone copied my website. I did an installation using uh, waterproof RJ45s like I've done, except they didn't use shielded uh, connectors and the their dish didn't work. Uh, he contacted me and said, hey, I followed your instructions. I said, well, have you used your shield? No, I didn't use shielded. He then re-terminated with shielded plugs and it worked fine. So it is really important that they are shielded uh, plugs, RJ45, and the connectors are shielded as well. Okay. Now, if you're not comfortable doing that yourself, that should be well within the capability of an electrician or network cable or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's it's, it's just standard computer stuff. If you if you go to a computer shop that can repair Ethernet cables, you know, computer cables, then um, yeah, they should be able to put a plug on the end for you. No problem at all. Yeah. Okay. Because that's just what we term category six. PoE or power over Ethernet because that's just the way now because Ethernet cables didn't use to really to carry power but it's a bit like USBs now you've got connection and power um, in one go which is which is really good yeah so I call Mike what other cool stuff have you found um, as you've been doing your tear downs and technical explorations uh, yeah so there's a lot of interesting stuff there and it's funny so of the tear downs of the dish that I've seen one of the early one you know mine was the first that I'm aware of, and then another guy in the States. And then I think the, the third one that I'm aware of was actually another guy in Nova Scotia who I know, and he's uh, Colin O'Flynn. And as much as I know about hardware security, this guy goes even deeper. He's got a PhD in you know tampering with, with chips that are designed not to be tampered with. Okay. Uh, so he, he went even further and he pulled off the metal black back plane and he's got a video as well where he does it and he use, uses a blowtorch to get that metal back off so that's that's always fun to take a blowtorch to your dishy and then uh he actually shaves off the cover of the chip and does some actual probing of the circuit board and i'm glad that he did it because that's where i wanted to go but by letting him do that i still have mine to, to practice with on my car and drive around with but uh, he actually did some really neat stuff and collaborated with a team in Belgium. And they've actually, they stopped publishing the results, which makes me think they're either found vulnerabilities and have gone through uh, Starlink. They have a bug bounty program where if you find vulnerabilities or security weaknesses, you can report them responsibly, but you have to keep them secret until Starlink says you can announce them. So it makes me think that maybe they found something and have stopped reporting on it, but they've got the file system off the, the Linux operating system on the dish. Oh, wow. So I've done some experimentation, actually talking to the, the, the console port, you know, logging into my, my Starlink dish. So they've probably gone that next step and actually found out the passwords and how to actually log in and, and kind of, poking and prodding around that part. At the start, let's say a year ago, I was doing this on my YouTube channel as a, as a curiosity. I was curious about how the system works. But it's interesting now with the war in, in Ukraine and Starlink being used to provide communication to people in Ukraine and Russia potentially jamming and the risk of cyber attack. And now all of a sudden, these curiosities have become very real for a lot of people. So it's I'm, I'm watching very closely to see kind of what disruptions or evolution happens there. Uh, it's kind of a trial by fire for Starlink in a potentially hostile cyber war area. So it's, it's exciting stuff all around. Yeah, I would have thought that the biggest risk would have been not so much immediately hacking, but the fact that Starlink transmits, and then that's in effect a beacon, because you, you can see it, you go, okay, someone's got, and that, that transmits, I guess, um, 
fingerprint or, or path would be pretty identifiable. Okay, there's a silent over there. Let, let's 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 bond that. Um, Marcus, any views on, on, on this? Um, I have, <laughs> but uh, so to my knowledge, it's probably classified. So I'm kind of like it's not an area I really want to start discussing on the internet. But okay, yeah. I've, I've looked into tracking things like that and I've looked into jamming. One of my specialties was electronic warfare. So, uh, yeah, I'll stay quiet at this point. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, we'll, 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 leave, we'll, we'll leave the speculation um, there. We don't want to threaten national security. Yeah. Okay. Um, Marcus, any, any tips for um, travelers coming to the end of the webinar now? Any final tips you got for people using it? Because you're probably the most experienced user, I guess, on the planet with Starlink in motion. Yeah, the one thing I've, I've tried to do with my dish is I've, I've kept the ability to be able to um, put it back on the tripod and reconnect the motors. And the reason I've done that is because sometimes uh, you park in a wooded area or you park somewhere where there's a lot of obstructions around where you actually want to park your vehicle. But having an 80 foot cable, I can run it away from the vehicle, and put it on the tripod in another area where it's got a better view of the sky. So that's that's a, a, a capability I wanted to keep. So my modifications, yes, I've while it's fitted to my vehicle and I haven't actually taken it off the vehicle since I've mounted it flat, to be honest, because I, I haven't needed to. But I know when I was traveling around in Canada um, with the high tall pine trees around, sometimes it's advantageous to be able to put it on the tripod and just move it 50, 60 feet away from the vehicle to actually get a better view of the sky. So that's a capability I want to keep. Um, it will be interesting to see when SpaceX does come out with their mobile system as to whether it will be permanently fixed to the roof of the vehicle or whether there will be an option to remove it from the vehicle and put it in a clearing. Um, obviously, nobody knows what the system is. Well, nobody outside of SpaceX knows what the system is going to be yet. But um, that'll be an interesting feature. I'll be interested to see how they get how they do that. Okay, cool. And Mike, any closing comments for you on Starlink for travelers? No, just though I I really hope that Starlink does actually come out with an official kind of mobile or, or portable Starlink option designed for battery power, 12 volt power. I think everything we're talking about is extremely exciting to me, but you know, we're, we're definitely doing things that are not recommended by the manufacturer and voiding our warranties. So it would be great if it became more widely available in a kind of an official package and, uh, just really opened up parts of the world to, to people who maybe couldn't go there otherwise, but now that they have a, a good, strong, fast internet connection can go exploring the world a bit more maybe than they have in the past. Yeah, and I think that's important. For me, um, it's opening up a whole new world of working, which is which is pretty cool. But for many people, this is literally life changing. We live in a digital world now, whether you like it or not, you can't really opt out. And yet many areas still have very poor, spotty and low speed internet access, and they're really suffering. So Starlink in, in many places in Australia is literally a life changer. Um, I'm seeing post people go, oh my God, this is just so good. I can now homeschool my kid. I can do telehealth. I can do so many things there. It is an amazing technology so yeah um so we'll close it there thanks everyone for attending thank you very much marcus and mike for giving up your time this recording will be on my youtube channel in due course and please um follow marcus mike and myself for more starlink updates and uh hopefully we'll see you guys out on the track on the tracks happily interneting thanks again and uh good luck with whatever you do with starlink thanks everybody <laughs>